Hi, I'm Very OK and you're in the stream. Today, billions rely on the oceans for food and their livelihood, but overfishing is depleting the ocean of its resources faster than it can catch up. Have you thought about how the fish on your plate got there? So our Stream Science Week continues as we mark Oceans Day, and that was on June the 8th, but I think the oceans need more than one day, exactly. for sure. <laughs> Malika Valau, you're sort of wrangling the community. We're talking about overfishing. How engaged are they? Oh, so very. In right. fact, people asked us to do this show. Okay, they good. use that hashtag Stream Science. This is the pitch from Adisa in our community. She says, most people in developing countries depend on fish for their livelihood. How can they protect this resource. So that's exactly what we're going to talk about in today's show. One of the many things. We want you to join us. Use hashtag AJStream. And joining us right here on our set, Elizabeth Wilson, director of Pew's International Oceans Policy. Elizabeth, it's great to have you here in the Thank stream. You. And we'll hear more from you in just a moment. So if you want to be in this conversation, there's so many ways that you can do it. Have a look here on my laptop. We're at stream.aldezero.com. Go to the right hand side of the screen. There'll be a little widget that allows you to comment on today's show. So if you do what I'm doing, you can also do this on your smartphone as well. You can record 30 seconds and then you too can be right here in the stream. I'm Nathan Richardson. I'm an environmental lawyer here in DC with resources for the future, and I'm on the stream. The global fishing fleet is said to be two to three times larger than the ocean can actually support. This means that fish are being taken from the sea faster than they can reproduce. According to a recent study, worldwide stocks of the biggest predatory species like tuna and swordfish may have fallen by 90% since the 1950s. And another study shows that if fishing continues on the course that it's on right now, most species will stand on the brink of extinction. Quotas and laws have been passed in many nations around the world, but a lot of fishing happens in international waters, and these vast areas of ocean are too big to monitor. So current practices are, in a word, unsustainable. Today we want to take a look at the impact of overfishing on ecosystems and our economies, but also look at a variety of ways that we can actually tackle the overfishing problem for us in the future. To talk about this from Helsinki, Helsinki in Finland, Vitsa van der Werf is the founder of The Blackfish. That's an organization that works to end illegal overfishing using crowdsourcing and technology. From Brighton in the UK, Nicholas Roll is creator of the Fish Love Campaign and co-owner of a sushi restaurant. And Christopher Costello is professor of economics at the University of California at Santa Barbara and also author of a recent study on fisheries. So good to have you here, everybody. Uh, Vitsa, what is the worst case of overfishing you've ever seen? Um, so we actually train a lot of um, citizens to go out in fishing ports, go out in fishing markets and actually document um, cases of, of evidence of illegal fishing and overfishing. So we're actually in the field and I mean if you're asking the worst case is for example shark finning in North Africa where uh -huh. um, sharks um, are, are taken out of the ocean, their fins cut off and, and simply dumped back uh, while still alive and, and also the catching for example of, of, of bluefin tuna. but caught when they're essentially babies, when they're only might be 10 or 15 um, kilos um, in weight. Um, and that's, of course, really disastrous for, for, those, um, for those species. Sure. Um, Elizabeth, for organizations like the Pew Trust, do they know what we've lost in terms of what's already extinct in the oceans that we've overfished already? <laughs> Sure, there are a lot of scientists who have been doing research in the same areas over long periods of time. Uh -huh. And for some species like the oceanic white tip sharks, they've yeah. seen them virtually eliminated from certain areas. And why is that? Are people eating them? Are they just being caught by accident? What, what happened to them? For sharks, it's mainly for their shark fins, which uh -huh. are used in shark fin soup in Asia. Right. Okay. And so it's the trade in shark fins that's driving the fishing. Sure. Um, I'm just wondering, Nicholas, as a, as a restaurant co-owner, a sushi restaurant co-owner, no less, do you feel a responsibility to what's happening in the oceans right now? Certainly, yes. I mean, uh -huh. but, but it gives me power as well to um, be very careful about what kind of uh, food, uh, fish we serve. So we were the first restaurant um, in the UK to take up bluefin tuna in the year 2000. Um, and we continue that work, um, kind of en engaging with our customers, telling them what we're doing. Yeah. So in that sense, it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity. 
Well, Christopher, when we're talking about what's going on and the, really the extent of this, there's a tweet here from Taylor who uh, sums this up. Taylor says, the welfare of the fish should be considered as well. Bycatch is killed by the thousands with overfishing. So for the uninformed and maybe those of us who may not know what bycatch is, describe for us what this actually looks like. Okay, by, bycatch is when you accidentally catch a fish when you're targeting, targeting one thing and accidentally catch another thing. But I, I wonder if we might want to refocus the conversation here and think about the reason that we're trying to conserve fish. Are we conserving them for conservation's sake or are we conserving them to sort of enable the livelihoods of the millions of people around the world that rely on them for both, both a job and for, for a protein source? Uh, are you going to answer your own question, Christopher? <laughs> well, I believe in the latter. I mean, I think conservation is important, but I believe it's a means to an end, not just an objective uh, in and of itself. Does it even matter what you're conserving them for? I mean, I think it absolutely does because the, because the way that you, the way that you intervene and the the approaches you take to conserve those stocks could have very different effects on people. For ah. example, if you close if you close large areas to fishing, uh, that can be great for conservation but it may not be so great for the livelihoods of, of people. Elizabeth, what's your priority? That, that I don't think those things have to be mutually exclusive. If you end over fishing, it helps maintain fishing communities and fishing jobs. It helps give, provide for a healthier ocean. It helps conserve the species. So I think there are management tools in the toolbox that can accomplish all of those goals. Nicholas, what did you want to add? Well, I was just saying that there speaks an econ economist um, worrying about the you know, human race um, and, and the economy um, uh, uh, and, and not really worrying about the conservation of species. Of course, as, as um, the lady from Pew has just said, that the two are, go hand in hand. Sustainability is both conserving species in, in the sea and um, s sustaining the business of uh, fishermen. There, there is and I think also... Go ahead. I, I mean, I would also say that um, like the overfishing of the oceans is a situation that really we've only properly learned about, I would say, in the last two, three decades. And we're sort of faced with a situation that we're really going to have to try and solve in a very short period of time. Um, when we're talking about conservation, for example, the establishing of marine protected areas, um, that actually means closing off certain areas for fishing. That's a very drastic measure, but it's a measure that is necessary in order to really catch up with the seriousness and urgency of the situation. So I also think that there is a lot of talk also on the policy level and especially within governments of sort of very cautiously looking at policies and approaches that work with industry to sort of try and improve things. But often it's simply not enough or, or the changes aren't happening fast enough. And Christopher, yeah, I, mean, I, I know you want to get back in here, but there is a little bit of pushback online about what you were saying. And so I want to uh, direct yeah. these to you. This is see no plastic. This is their handle. They say, well, we also need to see fish as wildlife. They're part of a vast ecosystem. And to lose one species affects all species. Another person says something similar. No fish in the sea means no healthy oceanic ecosystems, not enough oxygen yeah. on Earth. The end. Christopher? Absolutely. No, I, I absolutely agree with all of those comments. You you need conservation in order for the ecosystem to thrive and for people to thrive. All I'm trying to say is that, uh, A, I don't think we should just focus on the doom and gloom scenario. I think we ought to look around the world for places where successful recoveries have occurred uh -huh. and then try to replicate those successes in the places that still uh, that still are in, in, in drastic uh, need of recovery of those fish stocks. But I see you, you nodding. Are any success stories that you can share with us that we can go, okay, that's interesting. Absolutely. I mean, I would generally say that even though overfishing is one of the biggest challenges that the world faces, it is not such as abstract as perhaps other issues such as climate change. Overfishing mm. is something we can get right. Better policy, stricter enforcement. Let me just slow you down. Better policy. So better policies for explain that to us. So I'm shopping in in my supermarket. How will better policies affect me if I want to buy some fish? Well, the big problem with the oceans and especially with fisheries is the fact that a lot of it is still actually unregulated. Yeah. Um, the ocean is sort of this enormous global common we have um, mm. and it's a free for all. People, uh, countries, for example, a country like China can go halfway across the world just as much as a country like the UK can, um, you know, fish in the Southern Ocean. Um, and there's very little transparency. There's very little accountability. So stricter policies also mean that we have a better understanding of who is fishing where and that it's better regulated. Like without regulation, 
basically the industry and all the technological innovation that we've seen in the fishing industry. There's really the industrialization, which is really the cause of the big, you know, so the, the so large scale you, industrialized you, you fishing. You heard of a case where a Dutch fishing trawler was found off the coast of Australia looking for fish. Now, how's that going yeah. to stop in the future? Who's going to tell that Dutch fishing trawler? I think Australia's a long way to go for your fish. Absolutely. And actually, the Australian government changed the law and actually oh. banned this, what's known as a super trawler, because it is so large. Yeah. Uh, it actually banned it from its water. They actually changed the national legislation, and it had to actually change its registration, and the ship was forced to go somewhere else. Now, what is interesting about that case is also that it is that the Dutch minister was on the phone literally the same day to yeah. his Australian counterparts, that actually the lobby and also the, the links between the fishing industry and politics is incredibly strong, which is actually a big cause for obstructing um, better management, better policies and better enforcement of these fishing rules. And Femi, some people online are talking about that lobby. They're really indicating, hinting at it for the reason we're seeing what we're seeing. So this is Michael on Twitter. He says, first, we need science-based quotas for all fish populations. And then absolutely, we need the enforcement of them. So Elizabeth, there are quotas in place, but they're not exactly what scientists want them to be at. Is that part of the problem? That is definitely part of the problem, and it's easier for fisheries that occur within one country's waters. When you look at international fisheries for species like bluefin tuna, it becomes much more complicated. But we do normally have the science, so we know what the quotas should be, mm -hmm. but there's not always political will to put those quotas in place. And so we really need to build momentum behind ending overfishing and get world leaders to do what they need to do to solve the problem. Elizabeth, I'm going to show you something here on my laptop. Um, you're going to be very familiar with this, so showing it to our audience as well. So you see these deep, dark blue areas. These are around the coastlines of uh, countries around the world. These, this is where we have fishing regulation. The light blue area, basically most of the oceans, no regulation. You're out there on the high seas. You can do what you want. So, Nicholas, you've started to pushback about this. You love fish. You have a, you co-own a sushi restaurant. What are you seeing as, as potential ways of tackling overfishing? What have you done? Well, I mean, you, you quite, quite rightly identified the problem that I was in as a, as a, a co-owner of a sushi bar down in Brighton, that yeah. I kind of sort of had a guilty conscience as a limit to what I could do to, to further fish sustainability. There's some species I could take off the menu. Mm. So what I did is I set up a campaign to uh, really uh, to try to convince the politicians. That's where real change is going to happen. It's mm. going to be the politicians from top down that will um, uh, change the laws that will regulate, for instance, um, exploitation of the high seas. So, um, uh, uh, you know, it was in 2009 that Charles Clover from the Blue Marine Foundation, um, uh, he was just about to launch the end of the line, the documentary that was first to alert people to this tragedy. And he was struggling to get people's attention. In 2009, no one was talking about it. No one. So we sat down at a table um, with the producer of The End of the Line, Claire Lewis, and we worked out a way of doing it, which was to get a, 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 a celebrity, it happened to be Greta Skaki, uh, to take her clothes off and to hold a fish in her arms as if it were a baby. And um, it um, had an electric effect. Right. Um, um, again, in 2009, we asked lots of people to do it. No one wanted to do it because they didn't know what the issue was. Yeah. Now, you know, 100 photographs later, I think maybe you can show some photographs of yeah, fish love. We, we, we it's haven't been talking. It's getting easier and easier. Yeah. yeah. It's getting easier and easier to, to um, get people to... Um, do these photographs because they are very, very effective in getting the message out there. Um, and it is public pressure on our pol politicians uh, that will make the big, big change. And, and big changes has already happened in the last two years. I mean, the European Union has uh, reformed its uh, common fisheries policy, maybe not quite as much as campaigners would like, but they, they, they did went some way in doing that. And yeah. the next, as you quite rightly say, the if next could... big, big thing is is the high seas yeah so there are actually management systems for the high seas for fisheries mm -hmm. for example in the atlantic there's a group of 47 countries that manage things like bluefin tuna and swordfish mm -hmm. 
The difficulty is getting those countries to care enough to take action. And that did happen once with Atlantic bluefin tuna. The species really was headed towards extinction. Mm -hmm. There was a huge public push, a lot of scientific attention on it, and eventually they put in place quotas based on the science and now we're seeing that species start to come back. Yeah. So what we see is that if you really do what you need to do and put those quotas in place, you can see a recovery. Unfortunately, their cousin in the Pacific, the Pacific bluefin, is now at about 4% of its historic population size, and 98% of them are being caught before they can reproduce. So there's a huge problem in the Pacific, and we haven't yet seen action there. So some of these efforts that can really help build awareness in the public can really be useful to drive change in these difficult international forums. When you talk about action, I'm only thinking of myself personally. Yesterday I had cod for dinner. Uh, I had shrimp for lunch and I was worried because I didn't know whether or not they were sustainably caught, mm -hmm. uh, what, how the fishermen or, 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 or fisher groups um, caught them and, and what that process looked like. And so I know that there are some organizations online who are addressing that problem. I want you to take a look at this video comment. This is from Ryan Bigelow of Seafood Watch. Have a look at what he has to say. To the consumer, I'd say do two things. One, download our app. It tells you what, what to buy, what to avoid for now, and places you can go to buy sustainable seafood. And the second thing I'd ask you to do is when you're at the point of sale, when you're buying seafood, ask the question, do you sell sustainable seafood? It lets the business know you care and really sends a strong message up the supply chain. I know, Femi, of course, you have that app. Yes. I do. I've got two actually. There's one from the National Geographic here and you scoot down and you can choose your fish using sustainability rating, ranking heart healthy fish for instance as well. And then you click on it and then it will tell you all the different fish that you can actually eat and shop for. And then if we also we can go to uh, start your sustainable seafood, seafood search. Give me a fish Elizabeth. I'm going to type one in. Striped bass. Striped bass. Thank you for picking one that I can spell. <laughs> okay, It's going to search and it's going to tell me everything I need to know about striped bass and how sustainable it is. Uh, Vitsa, how helpful are apps and information like this? I remember when I was a youngster and we were looking at, uh, I put a list of food that my parents couldn't shop for that were grown and sent from South Africa because it was during the apartheid era and it was sort of old fashioned tech basically. Here's a list mum, don't buy any of this food. Now we've got, now we've got apps to help us out. How helpful do you think they are? Well actually, um we actually go a step further and really encourage people to question also the level of seafood consumption. Uh. Um, we are an organization that go into the field and investigate illegal practices and we have even found that in certain sustainable fisheries there is still a need to investigate because actually there is still um, you know kind of unorthodox methods or certain things happening in certain fisheries that are certified. So just the fact that it has a certification doesn't always mean sure. that it's entirely sustainable. What, what now, are you talking about, uh, about course, unorthodox methods? What are you talking about? Well, I mean, we have found in certain certified fisheries that there is still some illegal or a certain t level of overfishing happening. Mm. So I really think, I think people ask me often, they say, well, what fish can I eat? How can I eat sustainably? Yeah. And I think, you know, there is no way we can, in, especially in the Western world, where we do not rely on seafood as our main source of protein, there is no way that we could continue our level of of, of, of consumption and simply switching it entirely to sustainable. Um, sustainable also means we scale back, it means we question our level of, of seafood and of course it means that I individually that we question exactly where where our fish comes from, how it is caught. I, I, to I totally we need disagree to be with that. Christopher? I, I have to say that I, I think the data would contradict that. that. That's absolutely not the case. In fact, a recent study just showed that it, that if we were to fish sustainably, we could actually catch more fish, not fewer fish. So the idea that we can restore fish stocks and that by restoring them, by conserving them, we can create more food on the planet, it has been tested and is absolutely the case. So I, I disagree with your assertion there. Nicholas, and I, that would, I, yeah, go ahead, Vissa. Then I'm gonna chat to Nicholas. No, I mean, I, 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 this really goes down to, I guess, the theory around it. You know, the theory, for example, there is a theory that says if we stop fishing in European waters for a number of years, those, those fish stocks would be replenished and, and it would, you know, it would be a more sustainable resource. The reality is that we see, you know, relatively little action from politicians 
we don't see these changes being made that might make it more sustainable. And what I see, you know, the majority of the year, I'm out in fishing ports, I'm out in fishing markets, and I see atrocities happening almost everywhere where we go. And there is no sign of it stopping. Vitz, so what do you mean by atrocities? Can... I, I, I really dislike general, generalizations. If you're going to say atrocities, Absolutely. tell us. What, what are you talking about? So, for example, um, we've just been working in the last three months um, on an investigation in Italy where we actually work with the Italian authorities on ev uh, documenting evidence of illegal fishing activities. Now, what we dare find is that the forage fish, which are smaller fish such as anchovy and sardine, which should be, um, you know, a sustainably caught species, actually the fishing fleets, especially operating from Italy, yeah. um, basically catch the juveniles. They catch these fish when they've only hatched in for 24 hours previously. Yeah. And, of course, when you continually catch these juvenile fish, then, um, you know, these fish stocks have no chance to restock themselves, to replenish, to reproduce. What makes that, that an, atrocity an atrocity rather than b basic everyday fishing practice? It is everyday fishing practice, right. but from an ecological perspective, you it's find that an atrocity. An atrocity. All right, let me, let me go to the community, uh, Malika. Well, there's an interesting idea here from Taylor who says the other option is aqua farming, but those are by far the most cruel farming systems for animals. It's a tough subject. So, Elizabeth, is that a solution that you would recommend, um, making sure that you buy fish that has been farmed? It depends how it's done. There's some species that can be farmed on land, like catfish. Um, there are other species that need to be farmed in the ocean, and also, often this means clearing out important mangrove habitats. Um, often it means taking larger fish and grinding them up to feed the fish. So I think aquaculture could be a solution depending on how it's done, but it's definitely not a perfect solution. Um, Nicholas, you're talking about the bluefish tuna taking it off your menu. Anything else that you won't serve to customers in terms of fish? Swordfish. Mainly, mainly the bigger, bigger game fish. So swordfish is another one that I would never um, serve. Um, so usually we recommend that people eat the smaller fish that can reproduce uh, quickly. Um, so sardines, herring are very good, sprats. Sure. Um, those kind of fish are great. All right. So guess we're going to take a pause for now. I'm going to take you all to the post show online at stream.aldezero.com. We'll pick up in just a moment. You can also learn more about overfishing with Inside Story. And David Foster will be featuring a discussion airing through Wednesday. But first, here's Malika with a look at some of the other stories we're following right here on the stream. We start in Germany, where an encounter between U.S. President Barack Obama and Iraqi Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi is made for a lively discussion online. This video from the G7 summit appears to show Abadi trying and failing to join a conversation with Obama, Italy's Prime Minister Mario Renzi, and IMF head Christine Lagarde. Well, Twitter users were quick to imagine what the encounter meant for Middle East policy. Carl tweets, what happened is basically a metaphor for Obama's Middle East strategy. Pretend it's not there. And in Arabic, Samaria tweets, Obama happened to be busy and didn't notice, and you silly people made a big deal of it. Well, next we turn to Canada, where the story of Lily, a developmentally disabled teen, turned away from a children's hospital who has renewed concern about mental health care access. Lily was taken to the hospital by her family during a mental health crisis, but hospital workers ultimately called the police on the teen after she became aggressive. Using the hashtag HelpLily, Canadians shared their worries about the state of the country's mental health system. Let's hope the Help Lily story leads to some positive change, tweets Josh. Well, for more on these stories, you can head to stream.aljazeera.com and share your thoughts. Femi? Thanks very much, Malika. So tomorrow, Stream Science continues. And Elizabeth, we're going to be looking at some of the amazing science websites online and how they're teaching us science. Do you have a favorite science website? Oh, there's so many. Are you going to pick your own? <laughs> <laughs> I would say that the Pew Charitable Trust website is a great resource. There's all sorts of uh, interesting information about environment programs, both right. on land and in the ocean. All right. And Malika, do you have a favorite science website? I'm finding the best science stuff on Twitter. Right. I, I'm a little bit biased, um, but there are some great things out there and some great videos, so it's exciting. 
Let us know your favorite science website, your favorite social media science website. We may be able to include it in tomorrow's Stream Science series as we continue. And we're also begin, going to be doing science experiments as well. I'll see you online at the post show, stream.abzira.com. Thanks for watching. Hello again, we're speaking about overfishing, its impacts and some possible solutions. So let's get right back to that conversation. Farming fish. I just want to get back to that, Elizabeth, because it takes so many fish to feed the farm fish. So you get all this wild fish, you feed it to the farm fish and you get fewer fish at the end of it. How is that sustainable or logical? That's weird. It's not and logical I, And people or don't know that when they, they think, oh, farm fish salmon, that's good, I'm saving the environment. It's nuts, I say. There are some species... Subjectively. <laughs> <laughs> there are some species lower on the food chain than yeah. salmon right. that are a better choice for farming, right. um, like tilapia. Right. And so it, it really depends on the species and how it's being done. Who thought up this idea of feeding all this wild small fish to other fish to then farm? Like, who, who thought, oh, I know, let's solve it this way. Who, who, who thought that up? I'm not sure who we can attribute that one to, right. but I agree that it does not make much sense. Christopher, farming fish, does that make sense to you? Who do we have, Christopher? Well, I think there are lots of uh, different species that are farmed, and yeah. you mentioned the, you mentioned the seafood watch earlier, and yeah. they actually do monitor farm fish and wild fish. Right. And so you, if you go to their seafood card, you can get information on not just the wild fish, but on how sustainable farm fish are. Sure. Um, uh, Nicholas, would you buy farm fish? Do you buy farm fish for your, does your restaurant buy farm fish? We do, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I mean, this goes into the some subject that you're probably not interested in about yeah. sushi and... Uh, I'm always interested uh, in sushi. What's not to be interested in about sushi? Well, you, Europe insists on freezing fish oh. uh, before you serve it raw, yeah. which means that it's very difficult. I mean, we have to freeze mackerel, for instance, which yeah. makes it taste less great. Yeah. So, you know, we do we do have sea, farmed sea bass, for instance, because otherwise we'd have to take fresh sea bass and freeze it, which yeah. is, it just wouldn't taste as good. Right. That's the problem. Right. Okay. It's a ridiculous law that Europe has... has uh, What's, in their wisdom what was the what was the idea behind that is it health and safety what what health and safety yeah about parasites killing off parasites ah okay so we've, we've sort of farmed fish that that's that's one suggestion the other one was quotas Vitz, did you like the idea of quotas like only fishing so many to allow populations fish populations to kind of revive um we absolutely need quotas and we need to make sure that those quotas are properly enforced and that's, a, I guess, a point that um, in our work we make very much, and also because we work to support enforcement authorities, is that the, the policies and the quotas are the first step. And the second step means that we need to have strict enforcement and we need to make sure that governments and national agencies actually make sure that the rules are properly adhered to. Sure. Um, what's the reaction to the idea when you tell fishermen, oh, UK, you can only fish this much? I know with the um, bluefish tuna, that there were quotas for that, but the European Union said, actually, we want to fish more than this. And then even more were fished. So it wasn't a sustainable amount that was the quota, but there was a quota and that didn't really help that much. And now people can actually fish a little bit more because the bluefish tuna population is kind of bouncing back a little bit. It's bluefin, by blue the fin, way. Sorry, thanks, Nicholas. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. Yeah. So, so I mean, the, the, if the, I could the, make... The, the one problem with um, with this is the fact that, and we can attribute to the very strong fishing lobby, a very strong kickback on any kind of, um, in, you know, uh, decreased quotas or, or better policies. The, the fishing lobby, especially in Europe, is, is incredibly strong. And secondly, also, and this is something that Elizabeth actually pointed out before, is that often politics come before the science. So even if scientists say, this is what we should be catching, this is, you know, we should be cutting back to protect a certain species, is actually that politics then say, okay, thank you for the advice, but now we decide something entirely different that is mostly based on, on economic um, benefits um, and, and jobs rather than the sustainability or the protection of the marine environment. 
but 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 not even the the economics. I mean, one good example where where no one gains except for a very very small number of people and a small number of boats is deep sea fishing. Um, you've got a situation where. Um, uh, you know, 15 boats effectively are fishing d d deep sea um, and scraping the bottom of the deep sea, um, uh, an area of about Paris every three days. It's not uh, economically sustainable. Um, the only reason why they do it is because they're getting um, sus um, uh, money from Europe to do it. And it's just crazy. Yeah, I have to say that Nic yeah. Nicholas effect, I effect think that has, was... has it right. Go, I think go Nicholas ahead, Chris. has it right. And Vitsa, I think this is a bit of a naive view that the economic thing to do is to go plunder the seas. That's absolutely not the case. The best way to make money fishing is to sustain fish stocks, restore, the, restore them to historical levels, and then you'll get more fish and more money from, from fishing. So that's, in but, fact, but, the economic solution. Yeah, but the fishing deep sea is impossible. I mean, if you look at um, the, no. the numbers of orange ruffy that became popular in the UK um, uh, earlier this century, um, th th it's like this. I mean, it just it just collapsed within within years because the deep sea species take so long to reproduce. They were just yeah, they, so. I guess yeah. the question here Decimated. is if, if we if, because the question here is, and, and I was merely pointing out the economic perspective from the fact that politicians don't seem to get that. But if we agree that on the eco ecology, you know, the ecology side or the economic side, this overfishing doesn't make sense. The question is, how do we make politicians? Um, you know, aware, how do we make them engage and how do we inspire political vision to really take action on this issue because we are not seeing the issue um, being taken seriously as much as it should. And I'm, I'm, you I, do I it, think that you do it with you do it with fish love, with with campaigns like fish love. There's too much money. <laughs> no, it, 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 is, it, it might sound like a facetious comment. There's a lot of money going to campaigns that are uh, putting out scientific data out there on their websites. Um, but there's nothing like fish love out there that's actually talking to the people in very simple terms about um, fish and overfishing. I can't think. Can I mean, you totally, think of anything I, else? I totally agree so I with you. Um, and, and the reason what we do is we take people to the fishing ports to literally see what happens for themselves, which is another very powerful way of, of engaging people on the issue. All right, Vista, take a breath but, for but, a moment, because Elizabeth, gentlemen, take a breath for Nicholas, take a breath for a moment. Nicholas, take a breath for a moment, because I want to bring Elizabeth in, and you've said more than one thing, and we well, love all Elizabeth, the things you've said. <laughs> Elizabeth is an interesting case. Well, can I ask Elizabeth why yes. Pew fin finance quite rightly so many campaigns and yet don't aren't prepared? Well, I've never asked to be honest, but but why aren't there more things like fish love being supported? Because do you? Can I ask you? I, can you think of any other campaign that has succeeded in getting the subject of overfishing on? the front covers of the newspapers like Fish Love has. So I think there's, it's important to look at both the demand side of the issue and the, the supply so Elizabeth, side. Just take a pause for a moment. Directly answer Nicholas' question and then do what else you think is important. Okay. Yeah. Um, we are doing work on the demand side and that is really important. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is sharks in Hong Kong. Elizabeth, take a pause for a moment. Another pause. Nicholas asked you a very direct question. What is your very direct response to that? The direct question about why we're not doing more work on consumer demand. Yeah. No, I wanted to ask. What, I wanted to ask whether you could think of anything that that has had the global reach of fish love in getting the subject of overfishing on the front covers of the newspapers. Connecting people who have to shop and buy fish to the real the only, issue. That's what he's saying. What else have you seen that's done that so uh, visibly? So one example is work that's going on in Asia, in Asia related to shark fin soup. There are campaigns that basically get people to sign pledges to not serve shark fin soup at their wedding banquets mm. and to not serve it at business functions. And so this is something that's really taken off in Hong Kong. Sure. And what we're seeing is a significant reduction in shark fin soup consumption because how do they do of it. Are they doing it with adverts? Are they doing it with posters? How, how are they getting this over? It's very online, social media driven. Right. It's mostly young people, which is great. Yeah. And you're really seeing a generational change where now young people in Asia are saying, this is unsustainable, this isn't something we want to right. be a part of. Are they, uh, I mean, what Nicholas is saying, he's, he, he's got a, a campaign that is so visible and so powerful that it's really moving people. What mm. are the, what, what are the uh, shark fin campaigns doing that's really moving young people? Well, I think a lot of it is just getting the word out. A lot of people think that shark fins grow back. They don't realize that when you cut the fin off, they sink to the bottom and so die. myth busting. And so yeah, a lot of it is really powerful pictures 
Um, it's video of the sharks being thinned and dying, and so I think there really is a role for social media for being able to share that sort of information. Talking of social media, Malika? Well, in addition to those campaigns, there is one idea from Lynn who says this is what we could do. We could switch to other proteins. Plant-based and insect-based diets are the future, Lynn says. Skip the cow and the fish as much as we can. But uh, I know that that's not possible for me. So as a more practical solution, there is this suggestion, Nicholas. Um, this is from Omar who says, think advanced satellite technology. That could be useful in this aspect. Do you think that could work at all? Oh, certainly. I think, um, you know, uh, as, as the other uh, uh, contributors have said, um, to, to uh, regulate fishing is the big, big issue. And uh, technology can, can be a big part in that, yes. I mean, if you, you, sh you showed the map of, of the high seas and how much space there is, how much sea there is, I mean, how, how can we regulate? So technology is the key, yes. This is actually something that Pew is working on with an organization called Satellite Applications Catapult. And we've developed an information system platform where you can overlay satellite tracking, uh, visual imagery, oceanographic data, vessel ownership databases, all sorts of information. And it develops an, a log, an agri it basically allows you to look for suspicious activity right. and will detect certain things based on what you put in the system and then it will alert the enforcement officials so that they can help monitor huge vast portions of the ocean that previously were not able to be monitored. So this technology is all very new but it's growing rapidly so I think in the next decade or so the way that we enforce activity on the ocean will be changing significantly. If you could tell our audience one thing Elizabeth that might help them understand overfishing and, and maybe something they could do about it what would that one thing be? Just make smart decisions about what you consume. Ask, ask questions, check on the species, see where it's from, see if it's sustainably caught. And if enough people do that, what would happen to the business? Then the businesses who are sourcing the food will start to be more responsible and start asking questions than themselves, and that will drive all the way up the chain to the, the fishermen catching the fish and to the policymakers. Christopher, you could tell our audience one thing. What would the one thing be? That the future is bright for fisheries but we need to take action now, and the economic opportunity goes hand in hand with the conservation opportunity. And they could do what? Do they need to do I think, anything? I think at an individual level, people ought to be making smart purchasing decisions, and they ought to be telling their representatives in Congress and elsewhere that they want sustainable fisheries. Okay, uh, Nicholas, I've, I've, I'm gonna go via this picture here on my laptop. What are you posing with right here? It looks like a catfish to me. No, it's a cod. Okay. What? Are you allowed to pose with cod? <laughs> I can't remember the last time I had cod and chips. <laughs> How come you're allowed to pose with a cod here? Because that was Why one of the fish. Why wouldn't I be? Oh, because because cod was one of the fishes, fish species. It was very overfished in the Atlantic, right? Well, as you can see, it's a sustainably it's a sustainable le level of two. So it was a green mark. So it it, ah, it isn't actually. Right. But no, we've we've used a lot of um, endangered fish, right. which have. Um, for these photographs for the pur very purposes of bringing people's attention to the fact that these fish might disappear so you might yeah. as well um, have a good look at them sure um, I i'm just curious about um what it felt like to have a cod on your shoulder uh <laughs> what, was, what was that like it's like swimming in the sea it's fantastic <laughs> okay <laughs> i won't be able to ask the cod how he felt about it but there you go um <laughs> nicholas if there's one thing that you would recommend that audience do after hearing this conversation what would it be make the right decisions we're actually quite fortunate in in um in having this big big problem one of the biggest problems we're facing but it actually has a very very easy solution which is to make the right decisions about sustainability sure and so what do you have to add to, to everything that everybody else said about okay you watch this show about overfishing what's the takeaway for our audience I would say the takeaway is that there are many different organizations working on this issue and that actually your choices to act extend beyond consumption decisions. You can actually be actively involved to do something for the ocean. So we 
actually train citizen inspectors with our organization called the Blackfish, where we train you to go out into fishing sports to help document on sustainable and illegal activity. And all we ask for is two weeks a year of your time. So I think there are a lot more additional ways that people can be active, actively involved in conservation, learn skills, meet like-minded people, and do something that is more about you know what decision do you make on what's on your plate. Um, and I actually think that is the, the big thing, is that there is a diversity of tactics in this ocean conservation movement, if you will call it that. Sure. Um, you know, and we all have the power to play our role, our role in that. All right. So, Vitsa, Nicholas, Christopher and Elizabeth, thank you for being part of this conversation. Really appreciate all your different perspectives on overfishing. And the last word goes to the community. This is from Michael on Twitter who says he will willingly cut back. So he's taking that first step, though he says he might find it hard to completely give it up. All right, thanks very much, everybody. We're moving on. Stream Science Week continues tomorrow when we take a look at your favorite science websites. We talk to the creators of some of the most popular online science platforms, and we're also going to be doing some experiments. Don't miss it. Until then, I'll see you online. Thanks for watching.